Amen. You can take your seats. I'm going to need some monitor. They're not working yet. Uh, Praise the Lord. Thank you, choir, for reminding us of the God that we serve. I have found that when I am in places where the demon forces are strong, that if I will just take a little time in that message and begin to preach or teach on the oneness of God, especially Christology, those forces begin to dissipate under that great revelation. There's power in that revelation of who Jesus Christ is. Amen. Uh, Wonderful spirit here tonight, and um, we've had a a great, great time in the Holy Ghost. Uh, That's good. Thank you very much. Um, The first night we started with... uh, Brother John McDonald, and that was just a great, great message that kind of set the cells for our, uh, not only the conference, but for many of us this year. And uh, we feel, all of us men that are working together to minister, we feel that this conference this year is is more than just a, um, a time of, of, of feeding ourselves, but we feel that it's directional for uh, the apostolic people uh, crossing uh, organizational uh, boundaries. And we feel that what's happening here is having an effect. And I believe that there are many that are here, you feel that same a force that this is not just for the moment or to take back for a little bit of the local church, but that God's giving us direction uh, for the year 23. And uh, so we we've we had Brother McDonald started that. Then um, the next day we had Brother Bounds, and he helped us to understand the. Um, supernatural and how something can be in you for a long time, but then at an appointed time, uh, that is going to manifest and how to move into that. Uh, Tremendous, tremendous thinking. Last night we uh, heard uh, a new concept, uh, and maybe if you go back a long time ago today when we talk about a Holy Ghost rally or a Holy Ghost crusade, everybody just, you know, we kind of know what that is. And that is you work on getting a bunch of people that need the Holy Ghost teaching Bible studies, get them to a place, and then have them get the Holy Ghost. Well, uh, I believe in by the end of the year, people are going to be saying that we have learned now how to have a outpouring of gifts of the Spirit rally, and uh, set a focus that way. If you weren't here last night, you may not understand that, but this will become a standard procedure among us. Maybe there'll be variants, as there always is, but the release of it. Uh, Today, we heard uh, Brother Kreitz uh, give his testimony, and but out of that testimony came the uh, the concept that God is wanting to use the pastor, not just the special minister, to do the supernatural. And I think pastors have struggled with that, and that's why it's more than just the moment. We always think that um, there's got to be a man with those special giftings to come in and then we'll do the pastoring. And God wants the pastor to know that that needs to be part of 
his job description, and that was very strongly conveyed to us. It also gave hope for everybody, not just the pastor, but I'm mentioning the pastor specifically because there were a lot of pastors that uh, you're going to go back and there's going to be some few changes to the operation, and I'm excited to see what God is going to do in our churches that have this oneness faith. <laughs> Amen. Then Brother Kleindentz today talked to us about apostolic uh, structure, authority, um, and, uh, and, and laid some things out. And I think that's going to help us because whenever you get uh, um, a lot of uh, spiritual movement, there becomes spiritual freedom or there becomes natural freedoms. And that's why a, 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 an authoritative structure that's God-given, I want to make sure that we understand that's God-given. There are a lot of people who love to put you under their thumb and control you. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about a real God-given authority in your life. Uh, that structure is to help us uh, to be able to handle and not shipwreck when God gives us spiritual liberties. And, uh, and that is in the structure of being under authority. I think probably the greatest New Testament passage of that is the centurion that started out, and he asked the Lord about healing his servant. But he starts out by saying, he didn't say, I'm a man that has authority. He said, the very first words he told the Lord, he said, I'm a man under authority. That's how he started started the conversation. He didn't start with, I'm the centurion and I have a lot of people under me, so I understand you have spiritual authority under you and you can speak. He said, I'm going to start this the right way. I'm myself under authority, <laughs> and I see that you're a man sent from God, and I've heard the people say that you said you do nothing but what you see the Father do, so I want you to know I understand being under authority. And with that came great spiritual authority. And so apostolic structure is important. Not everyone, in fact, um, I dare say there, there will be a, only a handful of true apostles that meet that description. Uh, you don't need a lot of apostles because an apostle is, uh, can be regional. There are many times the works that they start uh, you need a lot more pastors uh, and overseers than you do apostles. But the structure that they set and the umbrella that they give us, you need a lot of that. And um, I think when we as a movement are searching for the fivefold ministry, we will see the pendulum swing way over where there'll be some uh, uh, exaggerated thoughts and some uh, but eventually it'll come back to where we have a pretty good balance. Anytime you start exploring something, uh, there's things that uh, just, you know, you, you, you kind of talk things out and it can go back and forth till you finally find that kind of balance or happy medium. And I think we're going to find that as a, as a people that are hungering to be biblical in all of our ways. Tomorrow morning, Brother Morgan is going to talk to us about uh, the gift of prophecy and uh, the office of a prophet. Uh, he has liberty to talk what he wants, but that is kind of the direction of this conference. He's been working through this. He's going to work in that realm. I'm sure there'll be a lot more coming forth. And then Brother Cunningham is going to take all that we've tried to do, all of us other men, he's going to bring that together in the will of God and release to us uh, a, a, a package of all of this through the anointing of God, and that will be, conclude this. And then for the next 12 months, maybe if the Lord tarries, it will probably even have a, a guidance effectiveness beyond this year, but especially this year, we will have a, a plumb line to work off of. And so I'm very excited for that. Um, what God's done. I appreciate all the music, uh, the, the prac I know they practice and they've worked very hard. <clears throat> God's a lover of music. 
And if you read the Bible, um, the Bible says that we only have one verse of Scripture that talks about the angels singing, and that is in the book of Job, chapter 28, and it says that the stars uh, and the sons of God sang. They were joyful when the Lord created the earth, the foundations of the earth. Uh, after that, Satan fell, and he was the chief uh, musician, and it's clear by the instruments that were prepared within him, and you never again hear of angels singing after the fall. So it becomes the church's job to reclaim what Satan took out of God's presence and to send it back to God. And someday the angels are going to get their song back when the church is raptured and we gather around the throne. And we start singing, worthy, worthy, worthy. They're not going to be able to hold back any longer. They're going to join in. And so what we're doing is we're re in the process of reclaiming things that belong to God. And uh, that, is the, um, that is the message or that is the job of the church. Uh, the authority that was lost, we're supposed to gather that and take authority and, uh, and use that authority, but not just authority. We're to take the things that belong to God, regather them and through this spirit of love and relationship we have, turn them back to the Lord. And so we're at a very pivotal point uh, among the oneness uh, people. And uh, the Trinitarians and the preaching of the gospel as they have done. Uh, when I was younger, I uh, was more combative against it. And there was, uh, there was an aspect in me that wanted to fight against that uh, until my father explained something to me that even then I didn't grasp, and I'm not sure that I wanted to grasp, but he said, they prepare the way many times for us. And I didn't fully understand that till I got older and began to meet entire organizations of hundreds of ministers that were Trinitarian and would teach them the full gospel and see them all get baptized in Jesus' name, rebaptize their churches, and get the Holy Ghost. And that was a perspective change for me. And so instead of having that combative fight against them, I'm grateful that many times they go into places where there are many heathens and idols, and they do the pe preparatory work of laying the groundwork, turning those people from idols to at least believing in Jesus, setting the stage for me and others, if we'll look at it that way, to come behind and bring them the fool and them coming all the way in. And I believe that uh, Jesus rejoices when His name is preached, but He gets extremely excited when someone that's apostolic comes in behind that and lays it all out the way that it should be laid out. Amen. And so it's very important that we understand this. Uh, the Trinitarians are not our enemies. I know that's kind of not maybe so to some of you, but they're not our enemies. Now, there are sometimes they attack us, and uh, we attack back, and sometimes we have to attack the doctrine, and we have to draw lines and stuff like that. But um, I can tell you that the church I pastor, a good percentage of them were Trinitarians, and they loved God before I got a hold of them. And the reason they came all the way in is because their hunger for God was so great, and I was offering them more than that message was offering them, and they wanted more. Are there any pastors here that would witness by just standing and say, that's, that's the case in my church? Would you just stand, if you're a pastor, and, and that's true in your church? 
Thank you, pastors. Thank you. You need to know I'm not alone in what I'm saying. It, it, it is true. Uh, we get people that are heathen, people that worship idols, but we get people that love Jesus but do not know all about Him, kind of like Apollos. We show them a more excellent way, and they become fervent for Christ. Praise God. And I know that some of you think I'm just rambling up here, but I'm not doing that at all. I'm putting little truths out, and I'm getting it prepared where we're headed tonight and what God wants to do. And His Spirit is so beautiful in this place. And so tonight, I'm going to uh, read from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and uh, talk about something uh, that is uh, in the vein of apostolic. Now, I see people standing. Please sit down if you would. Uh, I, I have to say this over and over because people think I'm being uh, disrespectful. I read my Bible by the hour, and I never do it standing. And so it's kind of hypocritical for me to come to this desk. The only reason I'm standing up here is because I don't have a chair to sit on. Brother Blackshear and I just spent uh, a week and a half in India, and I would teach for three, four, or five hours, and I'd sit and teach, and then God would come. So that's how I read the Word of God, and so we have that. There's not anything. There was one place in, in I think it was Nehemiah's, where they stood when they heard the law read, but there's no other place where that happens in Scripture. Nothing wrong with standing. So if your pastor as you stand or you're used to it and another minister asks you to stand, then let's do that. But with me, that's not necessarily. And we'll read some other scriptures, so I don't expect you to jump up every time I read the scripture throughout the message. And so you just sit there and relax, read it, take it in. It's all good. And God will uh, do just as much you sit. Do you know that on the day of Pentecost, they got the Holy Ghost sitting down too? And we got this thing, they all got to come stand at the altar to get the Holy Ghost, but the first time it fell, they were all sitting down. They were all sitting, all sitting. And, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong. I, I, I like it when they stand. I like it when they come down the aisle. Uh, but there's no, there's no altar call in the New Testament. I wasn't started by the apostles, the first century church. I started about... 180 years ago. Up to that time, nobody gave altar calls. They, were just, they just believed when it happened, it was supposed to have just fall upon the people. In fact, Peter, he had an entire uh, household that while he preached, the Holy Ghost fell on him. He didn't have time to give an altar call. And so, is there anything wrong with an altar call? Absolutely not. And I'll keep giving them here in Stockton for the reason that uh, it's, a, it's a tradition here, and we're used to it, and it seems to work well. And people that, are, uh, that come to churches, traditions sometimes help them get in past traditions into truth. Uh, but so there's a lot of things we do and a lot of things we say that are tradition, not necessarily anything wrong with them, but sometimes we make them almost like a holy commandment of God. And, uh, but there's only one uh, Word of God, and no Scripture is a private interpretation. So we're going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully or abundantly shall reap also abundantly. Every person in the context of sowing and reaping, as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, let him sow, let him contribute, not reluctantly with a grudge, 
or because he feels the compulsiveness and the pressure from those in the audience that are staring at him saying, why are you not given? We gave. That's my paraphrase for you tonight. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, the context of a cheerful giver is someone that sows seed. So you can understand it like this. God loves people that sow seed and do it with excitement and do it with faith. The contrary of that, if God loves someone that is excited to sow seed and to give seed, is that God has an attitude of resentment toward people that are ungratefully or un, unhappy about having to do this. We don't want to do this, but it, you know, we feel obligated to do this. God don't want you to sow seed with that attitude. It doesn't please Him. He wants seed that is given willfully with excitement and a right spirit. So let's look at some more of these Scriptures. Verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound. Now, to grasp that uh, grace abound toward you, the word grace uh, in most thought pattern is going to be the standard, the unmerited favor of God. Uh, so if we used to read it that way, it'd say, uh, God is able to make all uh, the unmerited favor of God abound toward you. But that's not really what grace is. We understand that God's grace is favor, and, uh, and every generation has had grace. Uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of God, and others found God's grace too. But really what grace is, is grace is God's ability to do His will. It's when God gives you the ability to do His will. That's the grace of God, because if He doesn't give you the ability to do His will, you can't please Him. And so His grace, He favors you so much, even when you're undeserving. He gives you the grace to repent, the ability to repent. He gives you the grace to be strong enough to make a decision to be baptized. He gives you the grace to be able to pay tithe. Uh, he gives you the grace to be able to be faithful to church. He gives you the… all of this is God's ability to do His will. And so we should understand when uh, we talk about the grace of God. So here it says that God is able to give you the ability to do His will. And that's the context that we're looking at here, especially based on the verse that precedes this uh, here. Now, it says that God is able to give us the ability to do His will, that you having all sufficiency, and that would mean a full supply, you having a full supply in all things. Uh, and of course, this particular subject matter is uh, of money, of all things, uh, may abound... Uh, uh, toward every good work. And it is in the work of giving to help others that this is being written. They're taking an offering to sin uh, and their collection to sin, and he's saying that God uh, is going to give you the ability to do this, and in giving you the ability to do this, He's going to see to it that you have a full supply to carry out what this uh, uh, offering needs to be to reach our goal. Now, right now, some of you are uh, tightening your hearts and holding your wallets and clutching your purses, and you think that I'm going to raise an offering, and I may raise an offering tonight. I'm not ashamed to raise an offering if I feel to raise an offering. Uh, and some of you won't give because you're stingy. <laughs> you're grudgingly. You're not cheerful. You want to come and freeload. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, my mother used to read us a little story of the little red hen. Everybody, anybody ever hear that? 
It'd be nice if I told us a little child story tonight. So there was this barnyard that had all these animals. It had a couple of horses. It had a couple of donkeys. It had some goats. It had some uh, chickens. It had some ducks. It had some sheep. It had some pigs, you know, just like a nice little farm. And there was a little hen in that barnyard, and she had a bunch of little chicklets. And uh, she found some seed, and so she asked around the barnyard, would anybody help me uh, disc the soil, because I want to plant this seed. And she went to the horses, and they need, and said, no, I, I don't have time, I've got this to do. She went to the donkeys, and they explained how busy they were, and she went to the sheep, and the same answer, and the goats, and, you know, she, she went to all of them, and... They didn't have time, so she got out there and, and worked hard and just plowed that ground, and then come time to put the seed in, and she said, man, that's a lot of seed. Is there anyone would help me? And she went around and asked every one of the barnyard animals, and every one of them said, we're too busy, or we've got to do this right now. We can't help you. We're sorry, and so forth. So she did it herself. Then she had to water it. It was the same story. Would anyone help me water? Would anyone help me weed? And she had to do this all alone. And finally, one day, the harvest was ripe. And she said, how many will help me at least harvest? Take the grain off of the, the stems. And nobody would help. And then, so she did it, and the sack was so heavy with so much grain and she could hardly carry it, so she went and began to ask, look, it's heavy. I can't carry the load by myself. Would you help me at least take it to the miller so he could make flour of it? And the answer was the same. I, I'm too important to do that. I'm too busy to do this. That's not where my interests lay. I have other things to do. You did it. It's your responsibility, da-da-da-da. So she did it. She come back with that sack of flour one day and started baking some bread. And that fresh baked bread aroma went out the windows. And it went over to where the horse was eating his hay and where the donkey was chewing a few things and the cow was sitting down regurgitating on his cud and and the goat was over here, and, and all of a sudden that smell got in their nostrils. And all of a sudden, they found the energy to get up. And they all showed up at her door, heads sticking through windows saying, we'd like to have some of that bread with you. And her response was, no, this is only going to be for me and my little chicklets. You had your opportunity. Now, in Christianity, we have a lot of people that when you ask them to do something, they're always so busy. You ask them to contribute. You ask them to help. Oh, I can't do that. I've, I'm busy this. But boy, when it comes time for something that's tasty and smells good and services the flesh. It's amazing how people can make time for things like that. But they can't make time to start the process to get it there. And that includes finances. It goes on to say in verse 9, as it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, talking about God now in this passage, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Verse 10, now this is a very powerful verse. Now he that ministereth, and the word ministereth there, 
is, uh, is understood as supplies or provides. He that ministers seed to the sower. Now, God is the one that supplies our needs. There are a lot of channels that get used, but there's only one source. I'm going to say that again. There's a lot of channels God uses to get things to us, but there's only one source for a true child of God that's apostolic in nature, and that source is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that supplies our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And if you're getting your supply from other, some other source, then you have found another way to take care of yourself, and it's not going to have the same nutritional benefit of building faith and building that ability to believe God for anything if it doesn't come from the hand of the Almighty. And so, it says here, he that uh, supplieth seed to the sower also will supply bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And that righteousness is in the context of giving, and righteous is to do that which is right. It's the context of giving uh, in here, doing the giving. That's the right thing to do is giving. Now, there's three type, three areas that seed is being supplied by God. First is God gives us the seed to sow. That's the first. Second, when we sow seed, a harvest comes, and we take that harvest and we grind that seed up and we make our bread and we take care of ourselves. So that's the second place we get the seed. First is the seed to sow. Second is the seed to grind and make a flour and a meal. And then the third place we have seed is what we set aside for next year's planting. That's how a farmer works. And I was raised in the far, on a farm, and so I understand this very, very well. And if you use all of the harvest seed, you don't have a future. Some people, they will burn up all the seed and then wonder why they're starving the next year because they didn't plant again because they used all the seed. They didn't save some. And the Bible says that God, when He does this, would give you such a harvest of abundance that there would be plenty of seed to turn into flour so you would have bread for your food and still have an excess of seed to have a harvest the next year. That's what He's saying there. And of course, we're in the context of money. But what is amazing about this, and the reason that I have chosen this passage of Scripture is because this best tells us what God means when He says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. If you do not sow, you cannot reap. And if you sow little, you can only reap little. But if you sow abundantly, you will reap an entire field of harvest. This works with preaching uh, and ministry in a city. If you constantly only sow to that little audience you have, and you may have an audience of 5,000 and be in a city of a million, that's still a small audience, small group of people. You can only expect a harvest out of that small little portion of land. But if you go into the highways and the byways, to the hedges and the slum areas and the wealthy areas and everything in between, and you go and knock doors and you try and get Bible studies and your people are with, you're sowing seed all over, you will have a greater harvest than the man and the church that only has seed sowing out to themselves over and over and over. 
It's the difference between being a farmer that makes a living farmer farming and someone that just plants a garden for a few extra vegetables on their table. And some people don't know how to sow because they don't have the faith in the seed. Now, I'm going to tell you something here. I know farmers by name that have more faith than most Christians I know. The farmer is the greatest man of faith in the world. Sadly, it's not the preacher. Sadly, it's not the child of God. It's the farmer. He has no guarantee when he takes that hundred acres of land and he disc it up. He takes seed that costs money and he puts it in the ground. And he has no guarantee other than it happened last year, it happened two years ago, it happened 30 years ago. It happened when my grandpa did this, and it happened when his grandpa did this. And I just believe the process of the sowing and reaping is not stopping in my generation. If a farmer ever loses his faith in sowing and reaping, our supermarkets will start losing that big lustrous pile of fruits and vegetables, and you'll be standing in line like a communist country wondering which day there'll be food that you can get. But the American farmer believes that when they run that John Deere tractor down that soil and break it up and then come behind with a cedar and put seed in there, that in a few months or next year, there's going to be a harvest that they're going to collect and they're going to be able to put some of that harvest in the in the grocery store so people like you and I that don't know anything about farming will be able to eat vegetables and fruits all year long. That takes faith. Sometimes a farmer will hit hard times and they'll go down to the bank and the bank doesn't always want to lend them money but they will mortgage their land. And if they ever mortgage their land and the crop doesn't pay off, they're out of the farming business for life. Sometimes those farms have been in the family for five and six generations, but they have so much faith in the seed and the process of sowing that what great-grandpa invested in and grandpa invested in and father invested in, I'm willing to put it all on the line to get enough money to buy some seed because I believe that what I'm going to put in the ground will pay the bank back and keep me going so I can keep being a farmer the rest of my life. Now that's faith. And that is faith in the seed, not in their ability, not so much even in the soil. They believe when they put the seed in the soil that the rain and the sunshine, yes, they'll weed it and they'll water it. They'll do what they can do as a human being. But ultimately, they get up every morning and they look out to see if there's a little blade coming through. And when the blade comes through, their faith has been rewarded. Because it means that the seed is producing like it was supposed to produce. And God said, the man or the woman that sows sparingly is going to reap sparingly. You want to starve a city? You want to starve a people to where you create a famine of the Word? The Bible says one place in there says they had a famine of the Word. You know why they had a famine of the Word? Because nobody was sowing the seed. Nobody was planting the seed. And, and you know what? There's cities in our nation that have a famine going on for the Word of God. 
Because no sower will go to that city and sow any seed to get a harvest. They don't believe in the process. What they want to do is go to the grocery store where the fruit's already there and take them a cart and run down the aisle of Safeway or Kroger's or Raley's or whatever store it is you have, Sam's Club or Costco or whatever, and take what some other farmer has spent an entire year producing and then take it home and fix it and say, isn't this delicious? And they got no dirt in their fingernail, no calluses on their fingers, no muscles to show that they've been working. And we got spiritual people like that that want to go where there's already a church and say, God called me to that city to start a church. What you really mean is you have a desire to take somebody else's saints and start a church off of somebody else's farm and labor and build your own kingdom. I know nobody in here is like that, but somebody listening online, I'm sure is. <laughs> and I understand that not one church is, is always, a, a, always capable of one city. I get that. And Daughter Works and, and other churches that are not Daughter Works, autonomous, if they work together, it works good. I, I get all of that. But there is an aspect that needs to be understood. Why is it that I can see a hundred new churches start and they're always being started in a city or right next to a city, maybe the sub-city, where there's already a church? And I'm not talking about daughter works. I'm talking about pastors that feel a call to go start. And yet where there's a place where there is no church and there's no big church around to draw from, they just can't seem to get the burden to go. I still have trouble with that. And you know what God does too? I remember they told me there was over 16,000 16, cities that don't have churches in our nation. I remember one time working overseas, converted a bunch of Trinitarian pastors to the oneness of God. And the missionary of that country, and I wasn't working with the UPC, uh, I was just there doing independent work, which is what I usually do, because uh, there's no red tape with that, and it don't cost me near the amount of money that it costs the UPC to do what I do, so I do, that's why I do it that way. And I remember I was converting these uh, preachers, and they were bringing their churches in, and the missionary was coming behind me, offering them $100 a month if they would join the UPC. And it, it bothered me. I said, do you know, I, t I told her, do you know that there are hundreds of millions of people in this nation that are worshiping idols? And I got a little handful, and I'm all actually over five, 600 miles from where you're based, and you flowing down here on UPC money to pay them to join you so you could send back a report to America so they could raise money? And you could look good. Why don't you just go out and preach in some of the villages and convert people? It's pretty simple. The gospel works on the hungry. So I have strong opinions. Whether I'm in my pulpit, whether I'm at home, and if I'm talking to officials or whatever, I, ha I have opinions, and I, I'm, I will never change on these because experiences form who you are and why you believe. Exposure helps, makes you what you are, and I've been exposed to stuff like this, and it just bothers me. I, I don't, I don't want to build on someone else's work. Now, I remember when my dad wanted me to come and be the pastor here. I can't tell you how depressed I was. I felt like I got the, my, kicked in the gut when my dad showed up at my house and said, Nathaniel, I feel some changes are coming in my life, and, uh, and I, I'm, I, I would like for you to uh, consider being the pastor. I didn't go jump up and down. I felt like I had been kicked in the gut and every personal dream I had was being stripped from me. 
My dream was not to take a church that was started. My dream was to start a church and pastor that which I built. I, I, you don't have to clap. I, I'm, not, I just, I'm just explaining to you the way my, my brain works. Now, you've got to understand, I was raised in Christian Life Center. My grandpa was here. My, my, my family was here. My dad was here. My mom was here. And memories, oh, wonderful, wonderful memories. I got the Holy Ghost in this church, not this building, but this church. I got baptized in Jesus' name. I got a call to God in this church. That Some of the saints were some of the most wonderful, godly people I knew. It had nothing to do with that. That, if anything, was the calling card to come back and be in that atmosphere with those wonderful people. But the call was to go out and do something and not live under my dad's shadow or my grandpa's shadow, but to build my own church. Sometimes it turns out to be the will of God, and sometimes it is definitely not the will of God. And pastors turn churches into kingdoms and enthrone their sons, and then all hell breaks loose, and the church goes and leaves the truth because they didn't get the mind of God. And then sometimes God sees to it that the son is put in because he is the right person who's God's chosen. It'll be God's decision, but the pastor has to be aware of the successor that he's going to have. Well, my father come and talked to me about that, and I told my dad, I said, Dad, I don't want a pastor in Stockton. And when you leave, I, I'm going to be gone. I'm here to help you. That was I, what I told my dad. Not in an ugly way. That we were just having a conversation. I remember about six months, eight months later, same thing. He come to my house, said, you know, I'm really feeling strong. God's change in my direction. And I told him the same thing. I said, Dad, I have no desire to pastor in Stockton. I want to go start some churches. I want to do missions work. It was the third time he came, and that's how many times God called Samuel, you know, and so I'm thinking, okay, God. And uh, I said, well, you know, I'll at least pray about it. That's how, I, you know, my dad always started that way. Would you at least pray about it, you know? And uh, I said, yeah, dad, I'll pray about it. And, 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 I, and the rest is, is behind us. Yes, I'm the pastor here. But I still haven't lost that desire to go out and start churches. I still haven't lost that desire to go out and build organizations. I haven't lost that desire to go out and convert to hundreds and thousands of pastors and bring their congregations into the truth. I, I haven't. I, I can't help it. It's what I think is a biblical pattern, and it's the burden and the desire that is in me. And uh, I, I want to do those kinds of things. And sometimes, and, 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 it's, and I want to say this because I, my church is here, the people that I love, sometimes I want so bad to see something more happen than is happening here in Stockton. And I feel like there's so many traditional boundaries of churches in the American soil that have longevity. We're 90 years old now. And my wife and I did start a church. We started a second church. We did with a church planting deal, and, and, and God blessed it. But most of the stuff I've done, God has had me do overseas. And, and most of the, a lot of the ministries we want have been overseas. But God has, has allowed us to do that. And you come back. But there's something in me that says one day, Stockton is going to have a revival that my that the first pastor, Brother Van Buskert, never had, that the second pastor, Clyde Haney, never had, the third pastor, Kenneth Haney, never had. And I base that on a couple of things, but primarily is the seed that has been sown through the years in this community. The amount of seed that's went into the soil has never matched 
the harvest that is went into the barns. And so one day, I have to believe it's in my lifetime, we're going to see the blade come up, Christian Life Center. We're going to see the blade turn into a stalk. We're going to see the kernels on the blade. And every Christian Life Center member is going to have to get the spiritual sickle and get out in the harvest and start helping because we don't have a long time once God sends the harvest. And you know what? I know there's a lot of churches in the oneness faith that are very similar to what I'm talking about where you have generations of seed that have been sowed, but your congregation and your church does not mirror the seed and the sowing process through the years. Let's go to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, and let me read a few verses of Scripture. Now, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed. Everybody say seed. Seed. And the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose, everybody say seed, Seed. is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Now, let me just make that real understandable for someone that may be kind of struggling with that. When you go to the supermarket and buy an orange and peel that orange and you start eating it, you're going to get some seeds in your mouth. That seed is exactly what you're eating before it grew. (laughs) And if you'll take that seed and plant that, a tree will grow that will produce oranges like the one you're eating at the time you plant, except there's going to be a long process of years between the planting, the growing, and finally the fruit. When you take that avocado and you cut it open, you say, man, that's a good thing. That seed in there is in itself. That avocado seed will not produce strawberries. It won't produce onions. It won't produce apples. If you want apples, you've got to go get an apple and cut it open and take the apple seeds and plant the apples. If you want orange seeds, you've got to cut the orange seeds Uh, uh, open and take the seed out and plant the orange seeds. And this is what it's saying in the Bible is that every seed would produce after its own kind. I know it's simple, it's elementary, but it's a profound thought we have going on here. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. Now, God said let, and what He said let, it produced. When it's spiritual, and and, and this is spiritual, even though we saw it in the natural, it was spiritual because God's Word instituted it. Wherever God's Word speaks, that makes it spiritual, even if it's in the natural world. Understand that. Creation and, 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 and bringing into existence things that were not the Bible says in Hebrews that all things were by the Word of God. He's a God that speaks. That makes the process of sowing and reaping spiritual. Now I want to read verse 21, and God created great, uh, great wells and every living, uh, uh, every, every living creature that moveth, which, was, uh, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. You keep reading it down. It talks about the birds that fly after his kind and his kind and his kind. Now, I want to take you to Genesis uh, 8, and I want to read something to you. Now, that was 
the story of God restoring the earth and reestablishing what uh, Satan had done to make it without uh, form or void, destruction run, and God has restored it and bringing things back into being. People on it, and the people corrupt themselves. And the Bible says of the people, it said that their imagination was only continually evil. And the whole earth was filled with violence. That's why the Bible says in the last days, it'll be like the days of Noah, because we're living in that same world when there's spiritual activity, the sons of God, the demon powers are very much involved in the lives of human beings, turning humans into animals. Doctrines of devils are present. There is a violence that is in the world and so forth and so forth that is going on. And so God says, I'm going to wipe the earth out, and he wipes the earth out. And when he wipes the earth out, then he says to Noah, he says, we're going to start this thing over. But there were some things that God said are going to carry over from the first world to the new world. Some things we don't want to carry over. Some things we want to stay behind. But some things we want to carry over because it's a process that is a law. It's a law of God. And so that law is going to be relevant in the new earth that we're going to do. Verse 22 of chapter 8, Noah's built an altar, he sacrificed, God smelt the sacrifice, it smells good to God, and God says, I won't make a curse on the ground, and so forth. In verse 22, he says, while the earth remaineth, seed time, that's the planting, harvest, that's the reaping of the planting. Cold and heat, summer, winter, the seasons, day and night, shall not cease. And God said, when we get to the new uh, uh, world after the flood, we're still going to keep this process because this law is effective. And so God put into effect, but man has so often operated by fear. And I want to take you to Ecclesiastics. And we want to look at a couple of verses there. Uh, chapter 11. In verse 4, it says, He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Now, God said, as long as the earth remains, there will be a seeding, a harvest time. There'll be a time to sow. There'll be a time to put seed in the ground. And, and if you read the verse, it sounds like it takes me about a second to get from seed time to harvest. But in the real world, seed time takes months, and if we're talking of trees, it can take years before we have harvest. But the principle is spiritual. And so therefore, the farmer is spiritual. In fact, the farmer follows some of the laws of God more rigorous, rigorously than most Christians. They believe some of the words that God spoke, even if they do it without knowing that it's God's Word. How much more should a man or a woman that knows the Word of God do what God says? If a man that doesn't understand it, he just understands the natural side, but not the spiritual command behind it, says, I can believe in it because it's of the natural. How much more should we believe in it, seeing it as the spiritual that manifests in the natural? Now, humans have a problem, and it is a problem that has happened for years and years, in so much that in the New Testament, the Bible says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. We struggle with fear. 
Most people struggle with fear. Now, someone says, I'm not afraid of anything. And yet, if we go through life and ask why you don't do this or do that, it's not always because you're cautious. It's because you're nervous or you're afraid of failure or you're afraid people won't accept you or you're afraid that it won't work. And we go through the list. People have fears. They're real things in life. And if we allow the fear to get in the driver's seat and get its hands on the wheel of our life, then whatever commandment God has given, the fear will stop us from following the law of God. And when the fear stops us from following the law of God, then Satan's plan and strategy has successfully been executed in the life of a man or a woman or a person so that what God said was going to happen cannot go any further because that process of the law is not being fulfilled. And you cannot have a harvest without having seed. Now, there is something that you need to understand. You don't have to be the one to put the seed in the ground. But somewhere, some time, some place, some person will have to come along and put seed in the ground. It has to happen. You cannot go to a field that has never had a seed and expect there to be a harvest. Somewhere, somebody has to plant a seed before there is a harvest. Someone has to go out and break their back. And the Lord said there was coming a day that we would enter into harvest that we did not plant. But what I want to point out before we talk about getting the harvest is that He says somebody planted it before we came to the harvest. He didn't just say you're going to come to a harvest that you didn't plant in the sense that nobody did anything to make the harvest. Paul said it like this when there was a little debate. He said some water... Some sow, some plant, but God gives the increase. There's got to be a human element before there's an increase. And if there's not a human element, there cannot be an increase in harvest. And so I want today to help us understand that there has to be an element of humanity if there's going to be a spiritual harvest in the kingdom of God. We cannot just sit back and expect God to do everything and then say, God, we're here to receive. We want the loaf of bread. We want to sit down with you, mother hen, and your little chickens and eat but we don't want to toil the soil. We don't want to plant the seed. We don't want to weed the garden. We don't want to water the rose. We don't want to harvest. We don't want to put the seed in the sack. We don't want to go to the mealer. We don't want to do any of that, God. We just want to eat when you get our table full of that bread you're making. And God says, my friend, I want you to know something. I'm not the mother hen. If you're going to eat at my table and you're going to have a harvest to make bread for your family and the wills that I've got for you, then you're going to have to get out by the sweat of your brow because that's the curse of man and toil the soil till the sweat comes down and put the seed in the ground. Whether it's revival, whether it's apostolic Action, whether it's miracle signs and wonders. Oh, some of you don't even understand what I'm saying, but I will explain it. It's going to be somebody that works that's going to see that. And so the first thing I want you to understand, before you can ever take a seed to the miller to be milled so you can have the bread to eat, you've got to plant seed. That's called work. That's called work. The second thing you've got to understand is not only work, but before I can do that, I have got to get past my fears. Because my fears are going to stop me from obeying the Word of God. 
You see, fear mainly is based in the natural realm on what the five senses tell us. It's, it, we got a storm coming. I can't go out and plant. There's heat I can't harvest. The weather's not right. Uh, the soil conditions don't look good. Uh, I, I, I can't. I'm afraid that if I put the seed, there'll be so much rain, the seed will come up and float away. And so I'm just not going to do that. That may be good in the natural, but it doesn't work in the spiritual. You can't observe the heavens or the signs and go by that. you got to go by what God said. But fear, fear stops us from doing. And fear opens the door to being intimidated, and it destroys boldness. And when your boldness is destroyed, you can never be apostolic because there's never been an apostolic action that didn't have boldness that drove it. And without the boldness of the Holy Ghost... You'll never be able to mimic the life of Christ that looks at a man that has his bed there on the ground and is laying there for years and years and years and say, take up your bed and walk. Because your fear will make you think that what if it doesn't happen? My reputation is on the line. And if it doesn't happen, people are going to make fun of me. And you'll go down the list of all the things in your mind. And I heard Brother Bounds talk about what he had a fear. And he went and prayed, took the crutch away. The man wasn't healed, so he stuck it back under and walked off. Where's Brother Bounds? There he is. You know what? I love that story because I have a story very similar to that. There was a kid that couldn't walk. He was paralyzed from the waist down, and I unbuckled him. You know, they had him strapped in, and I pulled him out of the wheelchair, and I drug him across and kept commanding him to be healed and, and drug him, and he was heavy and fell and did it. And his father come down and chewed me out in front of a bunch of people, yelled and screamed at me, and they put him back in, and I walked down the aisle with my tail kind of between my legs but trying to hold a little pride with my head up. I was 19 years old. That's happened more than once. And it may happen again. But that's not going to be my story in heaven when they read the roster and say, Nathaniel Haney was afraid and worried about his reputation so he wouldn't be bold and believe my word when I said, if you'll sow it, uh, you can reap it. I appreciate what you said because that's the humanity of a man that wants people to understand. Get past your fears. The process of sowing and reaping is actually the law of the kingdom that is the foundation of how everything works. You could take all the other stuff you teach, but if you extract the law of sowing and reaping, none of it has any value to the church, and none of it will work in the kingdom. That is the foundational law is called sowing and reaping. And so, we come back to this passage that he that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth abundantly shall reap abundantly. Now, I want to say some things here before we get to the final moments of this message. We have had services where people have given tremendous amounts of money. And I'm not, just, I'm not talking so much about Stockton, but I'm talking about the oneness people in general. I remember Brother Willoughby one time raised, I think it was a $10 million offering. For us, that was a big offering. At least we thought it was. It may not have been that big, but because we don't you normally raise them that big, that was a general conference, we thought that was a big offering. But maybe we could raise $50 million if we thought $10 million was a small offering. It has a lot to do with mentality. In this church alone, we've raised some big offerings. I remember one time we raised a missions offering. Uh, uh, 
it was a million one, and we raised we raised a million dollars, and a million one came in. I like it when we go over what we raised. But until the people of God get to the place where they're willing to sow their seed into the field of the kingdom, there has to be a financial commitment if God is going to give a spiritual outpouring back. Because you see, I can't give God something spiritual. that cost me. You can't either. What are you going to give God spiritual? The Holy Ghost speak in tongues? He give that to you. You go down there and say, well, my praise, I'm giving that to Him. Hey, 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 hey. It's good you're doing that, but the very breath you're using to do it Go get your own breath and then say, I gave this to God. Well, I'm going to run the aisles and, 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 and shout and lift my voice and give that that spiritual. I'm going to hey, 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 he formed those members and those arms and that voice in the womb. You, you didn't form yourself. You see, everything you have that would be spiritual, and you give back to Him, is exactly that. It's back to Him because it came from Him first. But God gave me a debit card called time. And He gave you a debit card called time. And when you was born, He put it in you, and nobody knows how much is on their card. Now, most of us, we can check our account and say in our account, oh, I've got $3,000. Some of you might say, I got $300,000, and there might be one or two in here say, I got $3 million. And you know when you go somewhere, you have so much money to spend, and if it gets below a certain, you've got to go back and reinvest or redeposit so you can keep using that debit card. And as long as you have the funds, that debit card can buy anything the world has to offer if you have enough funds. God give us time. That's on a debit card. But He doesn't allow us to check the balance. He doesn't allow us to see how much time. Don't know if a six-year-old is going to make it to six and die, or if they're going to make it to 60 and live, or if they're going to make it to 96 and live. Don't know how long or how much time God put on that debit card. It's a mystery to all of us. But he, when He gives you that time, that is His gift to you to do whatever you want. I can take that time and I can become a drug dealer and sell drugs on that de- with that debit card called time. I can go out and party, sleep around, take drugs, get drunk. I can go pursue after wealth and become greedy and just try and build a bank account. I can sit at home and do nothing, get on welfare, and go to the mailbox twice a month and collect a check. If you live in California, you can anyway. I don't know about your state. There's a lot of things you can do with that debit card. But when you take that debit card called time and you say, I'm going to use that time to produce by sowing seed. You've done something that God has only allowed one species to do. He created man male and female in his image, and he said, I'm going to allow you to create, procreate with a human soul. You're going to be able to make men like I made a man. 
by bringing the seed and the egg together. And so the woman represents part of God and the man represents part of God. And through procreation, we are so much like God. Spiritually, when we sow and reap into the kingdom for spiritual things, we are in the process of creating because the seed actually dies. And then from death comes life. And Jesus mirrored that when He said, the seed must go to the ground and die before there can be the resurrection and there can be the multiplication. And so God give us a natural way to procreate with that time. He give us a natural way to procre- a spiritual way to procreate with that time. And when we stand before God and we give an, an account of ourselves, the biggest judgment or Reward is going to be based on how you managed your time. Because that's the greatest gift God gave us. And when you take the very gift that allows you to give all the other things, and you say, God, I'm going to use it to multiply and procreate in this world in the spiritual kingdom of God, you have given God the very law that He gave you and put it back in His hands. And when you sow a seed in the kingdom, I don't care how long it is in the soil. You may die before you ever see the blade. There was a famous archaeologist that was working in Egypt when they were uncovering some of the tombs in the early 1900s of the kings. And one of the workers knocked over a little vase and outrolled some seeds that were in the vase that had been hid away for almost 3,000 years. They are busy. It wasn't an important vase. But just out of a habit, he reached down, picked the seeds up, put it in his pocket, and they kept working. Got home several months later. And they were cleaning his clothes, and he found those seeds that he had forgotten all about. And he said, I wonder if they still grow. <laughs> and he went outside and planted them. 3,000-year-old seeds been in a little jar in a tomb with a dead man. And all of a sudden, one day, he watered them, and they started growing. I want to tell you tonight, there have been some people that have went before us. Some of them we forgot who they are because it's been so long ago that they died. Some of them don't even have a decent tombstone to mark their grave. Some of them haven't had their grave visited for years. They've been forgotten by this generation. The weeds have grown up. No one takes care of the grave. Others of them we love dearly or the family loves and they visit him and take care of the grave. But they're gone. But when they had the debit card of time, they spent it sowing into the lives of people like us. I see Brother Emery... You know a man did that to you, huh? Brother Yandrish. He just kept putting into you. And that's why we have a great man here. And a sister, Emory. A pastor that just kept sowing in to them.
And Brother Emery and Sister Emery have been sowing into others, and you probably haven't seen it all come around yet, and you may not see it all if the Lord doesn't get here pretty soon. But we believe He's coming soon. But if He waits a hundred years, but somewhere, there's been men that have evangelized, missionaries that have preached, come home without the great stories that we love to hear and couldn't get up and say, I went back to this part of the country and I preached and I had a thousand people get the Holy Ghost, but they came back and said, I spent a lifetime and I only built a certain amount of churches, but I left a little foundation." And someone else comes along that never worked near as hard, but entered into their harvest, and then gets to come up to the pulpit at some conference and say, we had this happen, and we had this happen, and they don't even mention the individual that planted the harvest. And I'm telling you, church, we're in a season where seed has been scattered and scattered and scattered. We cannot stop what we've been taught about sowing. But if some of us, now we're where I'm going to get where we're going now. If some of us don't start producing, the apostolic ministry that we were exposed to that was sowed into us we're stepping on the grave disrespectfully of the generation before us. We can't have and do the church thing any longer. But somebody, now there's some of you, you probably don't have anything invested in you and that's how you feel, that's fine. But I'm preaching to some of you that you had the privilege of rubbing shoulders, sitting in an audience under a ministry, maybe at a pastor, maybe it was a parent, but it was enough people that put something into you and it has never matured and never come to fruition yet in your life. The harvest is not there yet, but you know the seed was sowing in there. And God has to look, because He's not a God of the dead, He's a God of the living. He has to look at those men and women that sowed of past generations, and He has to keep telling them, my laws are still in effect. And you're going to see that your work and your time and your investment into the generation you left behind was not in vain. But there's a harvest that you never got to see because you were the sowers. You were the planters. You were the spreader of the seed. But your generation that I, that's coming up, they're the ones that are entering into the harvest. They're going to have the apostolic ministry that you never saw on a wide scale when you were alive. This is the conversation in heaven that goes on between some of those precious saints that left us before this time we live in. I sure believe it. I don't know if anyone else does. But I have absolute confidence in the seed. You don't have to believe in yourself. You don't have to believe you're something great. But you better never lose your faith in the ability of the seed. If the seed has been put in you, it can produce things that your flesh will never comprehend or could never do on its own. 
because what is in that seed is the life of another plant, uh, another tree. uh, And within that seed is the seed of its own kind to produce after its own kind. Uh, Some of you have sit under powerful men and women of God. You went to conferences and heard some of the greatest preachings and stories and ministries and watched the move of God flow. That is the seed that God spiritually invested in the soil of the generation that I'm preaching to today. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Some of you have been struggling, thinking that you're the one got to pray it through, and you're the one have to do it. Yes, you got to keep sowing, and yes, you have to keep doing it, but quit trying to think that you got to start it at the beginning. And take it to the finish. I told you how I didn't want to pastor this church. Because I wanted to plant my own vineyard. I wanted to water my own crops. I wanted to drive my own John Deere down the field. And I wanted to do my own harvest. And I wanted to bring in my own. And my dad said, just pray about it. And some of you, it may not be exactly like I'm telling it happened to me. But you've got this ideal that somehow you've got to do all of that to get, and somebody's already done all of that. Now, I'm not taking away from prayer and fasting. Anyone knows me knows I believe muchly in that. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, you need to get away from thinking that you've got to do this and this and this and realize that there is seed that has already put a sprout up and you need to let it have a full bloom in your life because God's ready to do an apostolic work in the earth and God's ready to do things that no other generation has ever seen or experienced or touched uh, things you're not even able to imagine. Those people sowed seeds not even fully realizing what was in the seed they sowed. I preached last year. uh, uh, I can't remember all I preached, but one thing I do remember I quoted was that Scripture, they subdued kingdoms. We're thinking too small. And I want to tell you, my thought is this. uh, we got to start thinking. And and let me talk to ministry right now. And and saints, they're going to follow good ministry. They want to be part of what good ministry is. So if you're good ministry, you're going to have a following where people are going to do what you say and want to be part of what you're doing. I promise you that. And if you're a bad minister, they're not going to want anything to do with you. And they may go find another church to get involved in because you're not giving them any vision and you're not giving them any hope and and, and you're trying to control their life rather than give them opportunity. And you may not like that, but that's the gospel truth. But here's what I want to tell you. We got to get to the place where we start thinking of converting entire organizations. Yes, we got to start our churches one by one. Yes, we have to go and try and fill the churches we have. Absolutely. We don't stop doing that. But we've got to get beyond thinking that that is the utopia. And we got to start realizing that there is a harvest field that is white. That means it's ready, it's ripe for someone to go in there and harvest. Oh, I'm I'm telling you today, I feel what I'm saying about this. Mentality has got to change in the apostolic people so we will actually be apostolic people, but we can't because we ain't thinking it up in here yet. Uh, But this year, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to make friends with every pastor in your city that doesn't preach it like you preach. Invite them to lunch or go to lunch if they invite you. Make a friend of them. That's a novel ideal for some of you. 
and pray that God will open the door. You that do missions work, stop thinking about going and preaching in one couple little churches overseas and going to some place where they don't have a church and looking for God to save the entire village. You see, if you can think it in apostolic terms, then you've already opened the door for God to do it through your life in apostolic ways. I want to challenge you. You say, I don't have the gifts of healing. I got the gift of tongues. I want to challenge you to pray for every sick person you can, and not just in the church. I want to challenge some of you to, when you're out in public and you see someone that is sick and diseased, to get the boldness and walk up to them and say, Sir, ma'am, I don't want to embarrass you, but I believe God could heal you. Would you mind if I pray for you? If the ministry will start doing this, the saints will start doing this. And a few saints are already doing it, and some of us ministers ought to take a lesson from them. I want to challenge you to get in prayer and get so in prayer to where you get intoxicated in the Spirit. And I want to, I want to challenge you when something comes to your heart rather than just kind of praying about it, I want you to start prophesying about it. I want you to start speaking it out. I want you to use every tool in the toolbox that God has given you. I want you to do everything you can think of that might be apostolic. And if you'll do everything you can think of and everything you have, God's going to open your understanding, your mind, and expand and give you things you haven't been able to think about because you're using what He's already given you. Church, we are on the verge. Uh, in fact, I shouldn't say we're on the verge some of you are on the verge, but some of us have already crossed the threshold, and we are having a move of God that is unprecedented of what past generations did not have. I don't talk about, I haven't for years talked about my work, the things that I've done overseas. I just haven't done that. My church, half the time, doesn't even know what I do overseas. This past Sunday, it was the first time that I ever took an entire service and just explained a missions trip that we have. That's, I, I'm to, I, I do that to a fault. First, I don't believe in exploiting the third world or the natives so we can all shout and build ourselves up, and we do that all the time, and then raising money on their testimony, and they don't get any glory out of it, only we do. I think that's wrong. Now, you have different opinions. I think it's wrong. I think it's very wrong. And the second is, when you brag and do all that, then you got your glory. And I've always wanted, on the day when I stand before God, that's where I want to get the glory for the 30 years of work I've done overseas. Now, that's just me. And, I, and I, I've lived by that conviction for 30 years. And I have not told people the things that God has done overseas. But I feel led of the Holy Spirit to tell you some things that happened this week with Brother Blackshear and I and a man by Brother Carol, uh, 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 Carl Keller, the three of us. I'm not going to get into everything that happened. No, I'm, I'm not trying to do that. But before we left there, we had 550 pastors. Am I telling it right? Yeah. 300 at one place, 250 in there, begging us to stay and come up and hold three-day pastor's meetings and tell them about the one God. <laughs> Baptism in Jesus' name. They begged us. Begged us. 
Now, we've been getting those invitations and doing that for a long time, but you got to see that with me. And if Landmark wasn't here, I wouldn't be here this week. And I almost didn't come back. Because I get, uh, that, that's my, that's, that's, that's for me. And I've been seeing God do that stuff for a long time. And so when I get up here and preach like this and talk like this, I may not do a lot at home. I feel sometimes like I'm doing the best I can. But I believe that the seed that my father, my grandfather, and Brother Van Beskert and every saint of those stratas of time is going to produce someday. And what I'm seeing overseas, I'm going to see here. So I know it's going to happen in Stockton. I know it is. This church is going to see it too. But for years, I've got to see this overseas. And old flashy, <laughs> I pinned his ears back about baptism in Jesus' name. He's a leader of 300 pastors, and 500 pastors. That's the other one, yeah. And, and he rules with a rod of iron. You understand, these are tribal people, so it's like Ethiopia. When the, the tribal head gets, they all get it. And they also want us to come preach their people at night after the pastors learn. And just to give you an idea, some of those pastors snuck over early in the morning to get baptized in Jesus' name because they'd been pastoring a long time. They were afraid their people would see they got baptized who thought they were baptized in Jesus' name or the right way. They had a little pride in there. But hey, it's all right me. I'll do it in the middle of the night if they want. Paul did the jailer that way. But you know what old Flashy said? He said, from now on, I'm not doing any baptisms. And he pointed to one of the men we work with over there. He said, he's doing all my baptizing from now on. Whenever my church needs baptisms, he's coming up and baptizing them in Jesus' name. Now, people, I'm telling you, this is what should be happening, not just in one or two people doing missions work. And I'm hearing the reports, and people are getting excited about we built two churches here, and we had 100 people or 1,000 people get the Holy Ghost here. We've brainwashed ourselves to think that that's apostolic. That's maintenance mode. God, when I tell you God is converting right now and is going to convert, some people are saying God's going to send revival. God's going to do great things. And, and there's people that have that kind of a mentality. And we preach, there's a move of God that's coming. There's a revival that's coming. And I've been guilty of that in America a lot. But that's not my message overseas. And I'm trying not to make that my message here in the States. And I'm trying to encourage some of you to change your message, even if you haven't got the evidence of what you're preaching yet. The seed has already been sown. I said the seed has already been sown. The seed has already been sown. The seed has already been sown. Yes, we can convert our city, son. We are not going to be the only apostolic church or the only couple of UPC churches or apostolic church or this church or that church. We're going to have hundreds of churches that are oneness apostolic in our cities and hundreds of congregations that believe in Jesus' name, baptism, and the oneness of God in our cities. Huh? Because this is seed time and harvest, and the harvest is at hand, and we got to start protruding forth as if this is what it was was like it was supposed to be. I just, I just think a little different than some. I just have this mentality that's different. I want to convey it because I think it's so important. We talk about vision. We, we, we talk about vision always like it's tomorrow. I want to tell you, someday vision has to be what happened in the past. And we're telling the story of what God did rather than what God is going to do. And Brother Kleindance, I love your Billy Cole crusade stories and when he didn't go and you telling your story. But I'm tired of hearing a lot of those stories. Absolutely. 
Because those were years ago. And honestly, you're not really happy that they're years ago either. You want them to be now and to grow. You tell them because they're fond and they, they bring memory and they bring hope. And I understand that. And when I say I'm tired, I hope you understand what I mean by that. And we talk about the elders and an elder that did something in my life. And this, and we tell their stories. And they had this great story. And they had this great story. And they had this great story. And I love those stories. In fact, they've been the spiritual motivation. They've been the energy to go forward. But I'm telling you, I'm tired of hearing those stories. You have to understand what I'm saying. I don't want to ever erase their memory. I don't ever want to forget them, and I do want to keep telling them. But what I mean by I'm tired of those stories, I want some of those stories to be our stories. That's what I'm saying. I want us to sit down and say, God did this for me, or the brother down the road, or brother so-and-so, God did that for him. I want it to be stories that are happening today, not 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. I want God to give us a story. 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 I want God to give us our own story that are apostolic in every way and the world knows that Jesus lives. If you want your own story, I want you to throw your hands up and tell the Lord, i got to have a story. I've got to have my own story. I've got to have my own story. I'm desperate for an apostolic story.